Hey guys, this is Austin and John, and this is another episode of the Meat Justics podcast. Today, we have another special guest with us, uh, another member of the Walton family. Um, one of our last episodes, we had Brett here. Uh, this time, we have Dylan. Dylan is my my brother and our VP of sales. So he is hopefully going to give us another uh insight into some of the things that go on behind the company um, and give us some knowledge. He's um, our main technical knowledge person uh, around the place. He probably knows as much or more than uh, all of us. Um, He's got a lot floating around inside that head that we poke and prod and try to get out of him. Uh, We get a lot of things as we're making videos and stuff uh, from Dylan. He's the guy that when we we need an answer to something, he's the one that uh, can provide it. Yeah, if you've ever been on Meet Gistics and I've said I'm going to go ask somebody or said our application specialist, that is Dylan that I'm going to to try to get those answers to help you out. He's got a ton of knowledge in his head. So we're just going to try and crack that head open and see what we can pull out. I'd like it if you didn't do that. Wow. I like I like how Austin was like, um, he had to think for a second. Is it my brother? Does he want to claim that? It was, <laughs> it was a second thought there for a second. We we did uh, when we had dad on, uh, we were questioning whether you were a part of the family or not a part of the family, uh, but we, we eventually gave you family status. So <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. I didn't get that. What do you family mean? Family status. Oh, no. It was not. No. You it was had, close. No, you, he, he patted me on the shoulder. <laughs> he said that you could, Brett said you could call him dad for the rest of the day. <laughs> so you got a little bit there. Very small amount. Yeah. So before we go any further, um, we will talk to Dylan a little bit more here, but we always have to get to the most important thing of the day, and that is the beer of the day. So, John, what do you have today? Uh, So, this is part of a a 12-pack that is an assortment. It is from Prairie Artisan Ales, and everything they make is just awesome. And this is a sour 12-pack. So, this one is called Vape Tricks. Uh, there was also a blueberry one in there and then a raspberry shirt or no, a uh, rainbow sherbet one. And that one was just amazing. It was interesting. Oh, it's amazing. Only <laughs> downside is with Prairie. I'm used to alcohol contents up around 10. This is like five point something. So yeah, 5.9. So I mean, not terrible, but not what we're, we're hoping for. Speaking of alcohol content. Yeah. I am thinking this is potentially going to be the best beer I've ever had in my life. Uh, At least I'm hoping it's going to be. Today I have the Dogfish Head 120-Minute IPA. This is an Imperial IPA. This should be like an Imperial, Imperial, Imperial IPA. Um, But it is going to be really hoppy, and it is going to be really heavy. It's 18% alcohol. So I'm going to have to sip on this real slow through the whole podcast, but I have not tried it yet uh, because I've been waiting. It says you're supposed to let it sit out at room temp for like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So the last 20 minutes have been brutal. (laughs) Sitting here going, I can't, I can't taste it yet. I can't taste it. So I'm going to see what, what it's, what it's like. Just smelling that would give me a little bit of like acid reflux. Anytime I drink IPAs, I get a little bit of. Yeah. Not, not my thing. No, definitely not. Yes, that's right. You and I are on the same page as far as that. You're not a Could sour be. fan, though. No, I don't, I don't think. like sours. But no. stouts and porters were uh, sometimes, as long as they get up above eleven percent, right. I'll probably at yeah. least take a swig of it. I feel like that's a little bit too far to shoot. I mean, if it's up in like the eight plus, no. is basically where I try mm-hmm. to live. Yeah. Double, double digits at least. <laughs> that just seems unreasonable to me. So, Dylan, you are going to have to try one of these. I'm not trying one of those. These are amazing. I will not drink an IPA. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not that hot. Yeah, it's not. I've heard that every time. No, trust us. It's not that <laughs> it, bad. It's so <laughs> malty and so sweet. I watched like a 15 minute video on this today because uh, I I just I had to know more about it. So I watched a video from the uh, the guy that owns and runs Dogfish Head, um, which I actually realized that they were bought out or not bought out. They claim merged with Sam Adams, but Sam Adams is a lot bigger than they are. Oh, but, yes. Um, this is really, really, really good. Most of the time you get those high percentage beers and they they have like a liquor taste to them. This one, it doesn't really have a liquor taste to start. As I'm talking, I can feel it just kind of simmering and, and burning in my throat and stuff. Oh, yeah. oh sounds but, awesome. But when you drink it, it's, it's nothing but smooth. It's, oh, I almost want to say buttery. Uh, it doesn't taste like butter, nope. but it's just, oh, it's, it's amazing. It was worth 
everything to get this one. All right, I'll take a sip off. I don't believe that on an IPA. That is that is buttery and smooth. Mm. Yeah, that reaction right there, beyond <laughs> pulling back from the glass is everything. Yeah, no, it's uh, buttery, I think is the wrong word. It's creamy. Creamy, okay. But it's... Uh, Butter's made from cream. Yeah, the taste isn't isn't good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so well... But I hate, their own. I hate IPAs. So um, I do anything that's not an IPA from Dogfish Head. I mean, I've done it, I think, twice or three times already on these podcasts. It's incredible brewery. Absolutely should check them out if you haven't heard of them. Uh, some of their stuff's a little bit pricey. Are they the ones that do the the four pack? It's like a purple label. Worldwide stout. Yeah, worldwide that's stout. That's what we had in here that one time. Oh my gosh. I saw one of those at the store. Yeah. And I was like, wait, how much is that? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's even out of my range. And I'm the guy that only drinks double digit, you know, beers. And yep. those are always like eight to twelve dollars a piece. And that one made me shudder. Yeah. Yeah. They they can get a little out of control, but really, really good beer. They definitely know what they're doing there. Um, all right. So moving on, yeah, let's we get are going to do mystery meat. This is where either Austin or myself cook something. We don't tell the other person what seasoning, rub, anything we used, and that person has to guess. So Austin actually is up one to nothing in this game. He guessed one of mine correctly and Dewey, um, and I have yet to guess one of his correctly. So I went with the barbecue sauce this time just because I didn't really have a bunch of time to do stuff. So I'm hoping... Yeah, this We're not is, about to go down to nothing. This is almost cheating, though, because I never, I like never eat barbecue sauce. So, Personal problem. I, I don't think I have any chance of getting right. this oh, one. Okay, go ahead. D- Dylan's going to help me, though, right? Uh, like, no. Or does he just get a separate Yeah, he guess? just gets to eat. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, you guess first, and then if he wants to, he can guess after. Are you just going to stick that entire thing in your mouth? What are you doing? Yeah, well, no, there's four pieces, so I can't I can't take one whole one. There's only three of us. Here's a knife. Can you? You could cut it into Not a, too good a it's, math it's too, small it's edible too, piece. It's too late. It's okay. too late. Okay. Just sit here and watch you eat. Don't worry about it. He's already getting ready to pull up all of the the seat. He already has no, already pulled, got it pulled up, up on waltonsinc.com. I still think that's cheating. Mm. I know what it is. What is it? It's the honey mesquite barbecue. Is that your final That answer? is my final answer. And you're wrong. No way. Yes. Dylan, it, it has do you a- want to try one and take a guess? Sure. Or? Now, Dylan is well known for the best nose in probably the entire business. I can cook something the day before, and Dylan will walk into the, the studio kitchen and be like, I smell, and he won't always nail the seasoning, but he'll always be right in the correct like vein. So this will be interesting. There's so much sweetness to it. That's what made me think the... the I don't even know what our barbecue sauces are off the top of my head. Okay. It, I don't think it's Kentucky bourbon. It is not Kentucky no, bourbon. No, it's, it's not because I hate Kentucky bourbon. Have you had it on chicken though? Yes. Okay. That's the one place that I really no, no, like have, the Kentucky bourbon. I guess I can pull up a list and try and take a yes So, here. I mean, we, we could have uh, options of uh, South Texas. We could be traditional, sweet and tangy. It's sweet and tangy. Sweet onion. Oh, no, it's not sweet onion. I think those are all the barbecue sauces. Pretty much. You did say it there. It's one of those. Okay. I think it's... I'm going to say sweet and tangy. Okay. No. It mm. is South Texas. Really? Dang. Yep. Um, the sweet and tangy. Patrick pointed this out. I, I would almost guarantee that it's either a clone of or in fact is um uh wendy's barbecue sauce it tastes identical hmm. Interesting. and delicious i see I, I didn't think that had a ton of mesquite flavor in it and when i think south texas Smoky. usually it's very mesquite so i heavy i tried to do it on chicken to reduce the fat content to make it a little bit harder for him to guess yeah um, so that's why well, I you win chicken cutlets. You at least could have done like popcorn chicken. No, no that, but how would I do popcorn chicken with a like let you dip it in it? Yeah, oh, actually, or toss them in really it. Really good. Yeah, well, how would you popcorn chicken in my mind is breaded and fried? Yeah, well, okay, it'd be like boneless wings. Okay, whatever. Okay. Popcorn chicken, yeah, I would be boneless wings. I mean, that would be good too. Same thing in my mind. No, don't popcorn chicken and boneless wings, same thing. 
No, popcorn, yeah, chicken, and boneless go. wings are not the same thing. How, how are they different? How are they different? Yeah. Usually, well, th- most of the time, popcorn chicken is like it, it's it's a ball of chicken, and then it has that light breading around it. It's not like a a, a thicker, crunchy oh, breading okay. like a like a wing is. So, like, gotcha. they're more smooth. They're they're more like a uh, um, almost more battery. Yeah, they more use like a, flour yeah. instead of like a a panko breadcrumb yeah. or something. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Something yep. something like that makes me think more of that. Okay, well, we'll see what happens next week, but uh, I'm at least still up one to zero. So you are I'm, definitely still up. I'm happy, but yep. I'd like to have been two. two so two. we only count wins here. Yes. Yeah, yeah otherwise so, it's going to get too confusing. Well, don't you win when you... No. no. You, that, you just that, make the other person lose. Right. Yeah. That count's going to get and Sometimes that's just as fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's talk to Dylan a little bit more here before we jump into meat matters um dylan can you give us just like a a brief synopsis on what you do here um hopefully that includes more than napping in the nap pod you (laughs) say you do here yeah i I see where this is coming (laughs) this is really a performance evaluation this is actually an exit interview yeah (laughs) we've already made the determination (laughs) we figured you wouldn't cry if you were on camera so yeah so um well uh, so we've, we've got a uh inside salesman outside salesman um, customer service, sales department. So all of those people kind of fall under my purview. Um, <clears throat> the uh, outside salesman, probably I have more direct contact with anybody than with anybody else. Um, so we have uh, guys that travel across the country and they uh, walk into small processors kind of all over. Um, and, and those guys uh, report to me. Um, and so we cover everywhere from New York to Florida um, to Utah. Um, not, nothing west of there. Um, some of the Great Lakes kind of around there. We don't have anybody in right now, um, but uh, a lot of the other states and kind of that whole area, we have people that walk in. So um, uh, answer the questions for those guys and help them out on daily basis with different items. Um, and then also our inside sales manager who's in charge of customer service and in charge of our se- uh, service department. Um, he, he reports to me and so then dealing with with customer issues on the daily. So pretty much anything that comes down to touching a customer um, directly really probably ends up coming back to me at the end of the day. Very cool. From there, John, do we want to jump straight into Meat Matters? Yeah, you know I love that. It's your favorite it thing of the day. probably my favorite thing of the day. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the first one on the list I found this article a few days ago. Um, well, I technically didn't find it. I had, Someone sent it to me. Um, <laughs> I had heard about it. I um, wrote this article. <laughs> I wrote, wrote this, this article myself. But real quick, just to jump in here. Um, if anyone has an article or a news story or anything they want us to cover in Meat Matters, yeah. please go ahead and send it to podcast at waltonsinc.com. Uh, we might not always be able to use it, but we'd love to get that from you. And... This is something that Patrick pointed out. He's been full of good ideas recently. I do have to admit that. That's surprising. If they have <laughs> a kidding. beer they think we should try, they should email us at podcast. Oh, at they, they should com. ship it to us at 3639 <laughs> North Coma Terrace Street, Wichita, Kansas, 67226. If they want Attention, to do Austin that, Walton. we could even give them the liquor cabinet's number and we just go pick it up there. I'd be fine with that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if you have anything you want us to... Or you want to get our take on anything like that, podcast at waltonsinc.com. All right, sorry. Okay, so um, I got this new story sent to me from a buddy here in town, uh, Todd Woodburn. Uh, shout out to him. Uh, great guy. Best realtor in all of Wichita. Um, but um, I had heard about this, and then he sent the article, and I read through it, and I was like, this is what we've been talking about. Um, this is hitting on several key points that we've brought up in the past, either on Meetgistics or on uh, the podcast uh, through different things. But um, the sen- one of the senators from Kansas, Jerry Moran, has introduced a bill that is called um, the Small Packer Overtime and Holiday Fee Relief COVID-19 Act. Mouthful to say the whole thing, but basically... The gist of it is trying to help out some of the small meat processors across the country um, from what they're doing because we were 31% down on cattle slaughter this last month. 
uh, and that is mostly due to the large plants shutting down. But John and I have talked about how some of those small plants out there are really picking up the slack. A lot of those small guys are really doing what they need to do to push out more and more product. It's hard for them to fill what the big boys are pushing out, but they're doing a lot more. And I think we're finally starting to see a lot of other people out there in the country kind of recognize the kind of work that's being put in by those guys. But there's a lot of complications that get brought up. So I won't get into the whole politics on the bill. But one thing I do want to get to is I want to see if Dylan has any insight without sharing specifics. Obviously, we don't want to uh, reveal any information about customers that they wouldn't want <laughs> yeah. revealed. Small island rule here. Yeah. But what what are you seeing from a lot of our customers that are the small to mid-sized processors around the country? Are they uh, flat, under, busy? Uh, where are they at? Yeah. So mo- most of our customers, like Austin said, they're the small to mid-sized guy. Um, and so most of those people are, are picking up more and more business than they can ever handle. Um, they've got They've got people driving from uh, long distances away um, because the grocery store is either higher than they would expect. Um, and so they think they can get a better price by driving out to the small guy um, whose prices may not has be, be affected as much. Um, but then the other thing is just sheer availability. Um, I, I think it's it's kind of coming back. I don't, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I think we were probably in a worse spot in terms of going to just a normal grocery store and seeing you know, empty shelves in terms of no meat there. Um, but, but we have heard those stories that they're like, you know, people are driving from two hours, um, that we've never seen before. Um, you know, they get some of those customers anyways that are regulars, but, but they're brand new faces. Um, and so they're talking about, you know, what are ways that they can keep up and keep some of those new faces that they're seeing. Um, but uh, very little of what we do is, is food service people. Um, those people obviously right now are pretty much shut down or out of business. Um, some of the meat market people are having trouble getting meat since a lot of the meat that they buy comes from, uh, the bigger plants and, the, and then through a distributor to them, cause they're not actually doing any killing or anything like that. Uh, harvesting. Yeah, no, no harvesting. Um, shouldn't use the K word here. That's bad. I don't know. I think our listeners are I, more I than I'm pretty sure they know what that. happens. Yeah, so I, don't think, yeah. I, don't, I don't think they, they are thinking that, oh, the meat just comes from the grocery store, right? It's grown in a lab, right? Yeah. That's how it is? Uh, sure. $21,000 a pound. Um, <laughs> and and then, yeah, then we have several customers that are, are working on expansions right now um, because they're trying to keep up. Um, and, and, and one in particular, I even know they're working on doubling capacity in the next six to eight weeks. Um, and they're already a, a fairly good sized facility. So are they going to be able to do that? Um, hopefully. Wow. They think so. That's fast. That's crazy. Because normally when, when you see someone trying to like build an expansion on, there's usually all kinds of red tape everywhere. But I think that may be one of the blessings for a lot of our customers being from like small towns. It's, it's probably not like some of the bigger cities, even Wichita here, when we moved into this building, it was insane how much red tape we had to go through when we added on to the back of the building. It was yeah, and that's, and that's the way that a lot of the customers are. You know, a lot of them in, in rural areas of states, you know, they don't have to deal with fire codes like we do here because guess what? The guy that owns the plant is the guy that is also the head the, fireman the for the volunteer, volunteer fire, fire <laughs> department. Um, and they just don't have, yeah, they don't have all the things to, to go through. So if they want to build a plant, they just start, you know, moving, moving dirt, pouring concrete, and they build a plant. And is this uh, like a custom pack? Is it a USDA inspected? The the one that's going to try and double its capacity? US, yeah, USDA facility. Wow. That's <laughs> what I would think would cause more of a, a headache than anything else. Well, once you're, I mean, once you're USDA inspected, you're USDA inspected. So, I mean, start start doing more. It's not really a big issue. And they don't have a lot of say in like how you expand your plant? Like this is what we're planning on setting up. They don't have like a say in that. Uh, I mean, uh, to to some extent, yes. I mean, there's okay. still you still have to follow guidelines. I mean, but it's nothing that's out of the norm. I mean, they're already used to all those different things. Okay. So there's there's nothing really new that's going to be thrown at them. There might be something, you know, I, I don't know all the rules and regulations, but there might be something in there that is once you get to a certain head figure, something changes. But I I don't, you know, to my knowledge, um, I'm I'm not a regulations guy. Sure. I leave that for Kurt a lot of the times, but. Um, he's better on regulation than I am, but shouldn't, shouldn't it really be anything different from their size if they want to double? It's it's really just about a business perspective and having the manpower to get it done more than anything. You can you can build more, you can buy equipment, but 
you know, in this industry, there's still stuff that requires manpower. It can't all be automated. Otherwise, there'd be a lot more automation out there. So this might be a little outside of your uh, purview, but in general, I mean, you do talk to a lot of these small and medium sized processors. How long does it take them to get or to go from getting a guy in the door to where they feel comfortable letting him move beyond just like, well, not even just a meat cutter, uh, getting to the point where they can handle almost everything that comes with butchering. Ooh, I, yeah, I don't know. Okay. I, I would ever, imagine be yeah, years. Ever, no, everyone would be different. Um, I, I know that I had one customer um, tell me recently, he said, we quit hiring people that are that were butchers before because um, everybody comes in with their own preconceived notion of how to get the job done yeah. and, and how they're going to process. And he's like, no, he's like, you're going to fit into our system. He said, so if you're a good worker and you can come in, he goes, I'll teach you everything you need to know. And it's it's way easier for him to do that than to take people that are butchers and go, well, this is how you do it. And he goes, no, no, that's wrong. Interesting. Good point. So. Have you heard anything from customers around about uh, USDA inspectors and and what has gone on? I always there? hear about <laughs> well, USDA <okay>. inspectors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, I'm sure there's always uh, a little bit of tension flying through the air. But specifically with with uh, all the COVID stuff, like, have you heard anybody having problems with inspection because of that? No, not really. Um, I, I have heard of, of some inspection being laxed a little just because of a shortage of inspection. Um, and so uh, not not that, you know, I'm not saying that there's anything out there that's not going to be safe anymore. Um, but, you know, if, if they were putting in, you know, eight, eight to 10 hours a day at a plant, maybe somebody else wasn't available or they were sick or something. So now, you know, they can only put in six hours of that plant because they need to go to another plant and put in six hours. So there's been some shuffling around um, and, and at different levels, whether it's a state inspector or, or USDA, um, but there has been some of that. So, okay. Uh, so another story I, I wanted to quickly touch on here is because I think it's the first, at least that I'm aware of, but uh, a chicken plant by Purdue just closed down. Um, that was in Iowa. And had, can't remember, but it was it, it was a large number of uh, COVID cases. So they just decided to shut the whole thing down, um, I believe, for two weeks. Now, per pound, chicken, y- you get a small amount of meat per animal. But a ridiculous number of chickens go through those plants a day. I mean, it is crazy. So I would not be surprised at all if we start seeing some real shortage of chicken at your grocery store. I mean, one plant could. No, uh, you don't think so. No, because because chickens have such a fast turnaround. You know, it's this isn't like that's why that's why hogs. You know, the the market bounces back faster on hogs than it does on beef because you know beef it takes us two years to get a yeah. beef out of it. You know, hogs is is half that time less. And then, you know, chickens are, we're talking weeks right. to get chickens. So, the, yeah, plant, plant closes down. And, yeah, it's, it's a huge number of chickens, but it's it's not um, – it, it usually bounces back faster just because they, they do cycle through so fast on, on the chickens. Right. Okay. So you're saying once that plant opens back up. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. 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 That that does yeah. make sense. The okay. thing that, the thing that makes chicken tartar is is you know you you can have somebody butcher a beef. There's not a lot of people that want to butcher chickens mm-hmm. just because it's it's such a, a labor intensive product. Like you said, for the amount of meat that you yep. get out of it, um, that's why a lot of chicken um, slaughter is done by large manufacturing facilities. Um, and it's much more automation and chicken processing than in beef or pork. That would make sense. Yeah. Definitely would make sense. Thank you. See, I told you he would be a good guest. <laughs> he didn't want to have you on. I don't know. It's weird. So I, th- this it may, may be a no, but Dylan, have you ever been to a plant and seen or at least talked to somebody who does chickens? I've never seen somebody actually running chickens. Um, I have been in plants that have chicken lines. Um, they're, they're not obviously near the scale of the larger yeah. facilities. 
Um, but I've been in where they actually have chicken lines, you know, and, and they have overhead conveyor systems um, that, that move the chickens around and hang them, hang them by their feet. And it makes uh, the processing easier um, instead of just trying to pick a chicken up. Um, and so the, the, I've been in places that have that, but I've never actually seen them running chickens before. So how, how do they begin? And I'm getting on tangent, but now I'm interested. How do they begin uh, the harvest process? Like with with a, a with cattle, you're gonna either use a gun or a stunner or something. There with pork, you may use like a a stunner, um, like an electric stunner. But with chicken, what do you do? Uh, I'm not sure what they're doing in most of those big facilities because we don't really do anything there. My first guess would be that. Um, probably doing a lot of electric stun and and probably a lot of gas yeah i, no, I believe it's be, gas that'd be my guess the, the smaller guys um i mean we, we we sell a knock gun that has a small cartridge for doing poultry um why don't you just cut, no. why wouldn't you just cut its head off all right yeah you can just do that right, yeah, yeah. I would imagine that's easier than trying to like keep it steady yeah. and knock yeah. it yeah i would think just a but, nice you know, I haven't tree trimmer a lot of, <laughs> I haven't been around a lot of chicken kill. <laughs> John, you tell that story? I don't know what story your father, is. So. Uh, Go ahead and tell me. We can always cut it out yeah. if needed. Uh, it's what I mean. We'll have to have Brett back on and we will make him Just tell the story. story without, we won't name anybody, but trust me, it is well worth it. It's my favorite story. When I first started working <laughs> here and he told me that, I went back to visit my family and friends in New York. <laughs> And I told every single person that story. Uh, I mean, I was averaging probably three, three tells a day. Three tells Everybody a day. loved it. It was amazing. It's kind of slow. Pick up best pace. best story. I bumped had. those numbers up. <laughs> Rookie numbers. Rookie numbers. All right. So uh, moving on, um, just real quick. The even with everybody buying meat like crazy from their butcher, from the grocery store, from their packers, frozen. <laughs> Food has seen the largest gain out of everything. Now, makes some sense for sure. People are thinking longevity at this point. And whether it's true or not, you do tend to think a product that's already frozen is going to last you longer. That's not necessarily the case. If you have some equipment at home, like a vac bag or uh, a vac machine and some vac bags, you can vacuum seal it and you freeze it and get extended life. But it is... A, one way to look at things and see kind of what people are thinking and they are looking ahead to their own food supply even as things seem to be getting a little bit better we seem to be coming out of this lockdown um but people still seem to be food prepping kind of well the other thing you have to remember is most people anymore don't know how to cook at home and so we, we see things like, you know, there's uh, uh, frozen foods on the rise. Uh, the biggest seller year over year right now in meat, I believe, is still hot dogs. Um, you know, th things like that that are simpler and easier to make um, are, are what people are buying because a lot of people anymore don't don't know how to take a roast home. And what, what do I do with a roast? You know, they don't they don't know what to do with that. So if I buy a, a frozen meal that I throw in the microwave or frozen pizza and I throw it in the oven, um, you know that that's way easier. I'm I'm one of them. I mean, I don't I don't say that thinking that you know I go home and cook roasts every night. I love my frozen food, but I was doing this beforehand also. Yeah, but you absolutely could cook a meal if you wanted. I don't understand most of it. People th that that makes me sad. I feel bad for those people who are just used to eating frozen food that's probably full of a bunch of stuff that they shouldn't ideally be eating, especially not every night. If you start bashing on my Totino's pizzas, they're garbage. We're gonna have <laughs> we're gonna have words. Dylan's on <laughs> oh, my are side. You on, here. Oh, great! <laughs> words. Awesome. You know what? Um, I will send one of those to uh, what's his name, Dave Portnoy, uh, the Barstool Bar Sport. Yeah. yeah, and have him review that. I, I guarantee you'd be like four point two out of five. That's pretty good. You know, it's out of ten. <laughs> that's what I thought. Out of ten. Four point two out of five. That's probably about where I would rank them too. All right, and then uh, for the last meat matters of the day, uh, it looks like the African swine flu continues to just spread through all of Asia. It's in the Philippines now. Um, there was a, a, a small island in the Philippines that had a, a processing plant that uh, 
I think it was like 16,000 uh, hogs just died of it. Not ones that they had to get rid of because yeah, they were infected, but just died from it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, luckily we don't have it here. Do you have any idea what the USDA, any of those are doing to to prevent the spread of that? Because if I mean, that would be yeah, devastating. I got, I got no idea. Okay. Just not read up on the scary. ASF. Yeah, you use three letters menageries around here. What'd you call it? ASF? ASF. African yeah. swine flu. Yeah, makes sense. Then, then you're a real professional. You start using <laughs> three-letter acronyms. Then you're yeah. you're in the meat food science world. Yeah, what everything's all we do. Everything scary has like three or four letters for yeah what it is, and it gets confusing. But there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. Uh, oh, FDA. I say that all the time. There you go. USDA. <laughs> I've got it. No, USDA. Four. Right? Oh yeah, three or four. Grass. No, you said three. Three I or four. Three or four. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well then, yeah. Then I do that all the time. So, all right. I don't think we have any other meat matters we want to talk about. Um, while we have Dylan here, one of the things that we really were interested in, in getting you to give some of your knowledge on uh, is cure and cure accelerators. So for anyone who doesn't know at home, if you're making a cured sausage, like a summer sausage, a snack stick, just a regular cured sausage, you're going to add the cure, which is sodium nitrite uh, mixed in with salt. And then you're going to hold it for 12 hours while that cure works in the meat. A cure accelerator is something you can add to your meat that's going to let you go directly from stuffing right to the smokehouse. So uh, just quickly, a couple of those are um, encapsulated citric acid, uh, smoked meat uh, stabilizer. stabilizer yeah. Thank you. Um and then there are some other ones that are really sodium erythorbate, which is really just for a commercial processor. You have to measure such a small amount yeah, that it really shouldn't one. be used. In. But we have the new precision scale. But we do have the precision scale, which will measure in fractions of a gram accurately. So, I mean, maybe more a little bit open to the, the home user now. But yeah, definitely not one of those things that you can use without a scale. Um, it'd be good for anybody making stuff at home that you have a scale anyways. Um, but especially when you start getting into some of those different ingredients, whether it's sure cure or sodium erythorbate, that way you don't put in and then read the label. We don't want to put a pound of sodium erythorbate in a product. No John? one's ever done that before, <laughs> have they? Uh, Dylan is telling or making reference to a story where I was making up uh, a batch of andouille. And Dylan just happened to be walking by and looked in and he looked in the bottom of my mixture. He goes, ooh, all your sodium erythorbate just clumped at the bottom. And I said, no, I put way more than that in. And he looked at me and I just started thinking, I'm like, oh, no. So we sell it in uh, one pound and five pound bags, I think. Yep, yep. Uh, seven eighths of an ounce is enough for 100 pounds of meat. I was making, I don't even think it was a 25 pound batch. I, for some reason, I think it was a 20 pound batch. And I had it. <laughs> One pound of <laughs> sodium erythorbate. I want to know how you did the math on that. Uh, there was no math going. I just said, oh, this goes in there. <laughs> just one bag per. That's how you do everything. <laughs> so one bag. Um, you told me at the time that it probably wouldn't have killed anyone. It just I said that to make you feel okay. better. I really had no idea. You probably messed somebody up. So luckily, uh, that never made it past. Ne that never even made it to the stuffing stage. It got thrown right out right then. Um, you didn't try to pick out all the pieces and just keep oh, going. We with didn't. It. You, no. you would have thought I ran over his puppy dog look on his face. <laughs> now, huh? part of that is that was the second time we had tried to make a video on making andouille. The first time I did it, I was doing it by myself, and it was completely out of focus. The entire <laughs> thing it was just unusable. It was terrible. I felt so bad. All right, so talking about cure accelerators and mm -hmm. a little bit of uh, specifically the science of cure, what uh -huh. is actually happening when we're quote unquote curing a sausage? So we have, like you said, we have sodium nitrite, which would be what we use in, in sure cure. Um, then there's also sodium nitrate, um, which we typically don't sell much of. Um, you can't get um for other names out there there's and i don't remember you could probably tell me which one is which and number one and number two in terms of is it speed cure or something yeah, like that, is, that that people use the name a lot of um 
So, uh, but what we use is sodium nitrite, which is already stepped down from sodium nitrate. Um, when you, when we put that into the meat, what it does is it combines, um, and, and actually changes once more into just nitric oxide, um, which is a gas. Um, and, and that gas then, um, combines with the myoglobin and it gives us kind of a dull red color. Um, so when, and then after that, um, it, it forms, uh, nitric oxide, um, met myoglobin, so a lot of something like that. It's a hard um, word. I'm it not sure. I don't remember what the middle process is there. Um, but basically that's where it, it turns brown or tan. So when you're mixing okay. meat up, you get plenty of fresh meat that, you know, if you would have left it out for that long, it doesn't turn brown by itself. I mean, you'd have to wait like overnight for it to turn brown, um, or several hours, but within a matter of minutes, it'll start to turn kind of a gray yeah. brown color. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that nitric oxide in there kind of, kind of reacting. Um, and, and the met myoglobin, um, of that protein. And then f we're going to take some heat. Once we add some heat to that, um, then it forms, uh, a nitric oxide stable compound of hemochrome, um, which we called, uh, your favorite word, nitrosyl hemochrome. That's a good one. So, I'm going to win a Scrabble game with that. <laughs> nitrosyl hemochrome. If you can get it, that'd be impressive. <laughs> I don't know how much room you have on the board, but someone has to spell chrome first. Yeah. 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 You can do it. You might be able to get it. Um, and that'd be that cured meat pit pigment color um, that has that pink color to it. Um, and then from there, there's a variety of factors that affect how pink it is, whether the pink color stays, whether it fades, light, air, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So like I said in the beginning, normally we would add the sure cure, which is sodium nitrite. It's 6.25% of that mixed in with salt and pink dye. Correct. Um, yep. So what is happening when we're adding the cure accelerators so all, all that a cure accelerator does is it helps that that conversion process happen a little bit quicker um and so uh, but basically all it's doing is is reducing that that nitrite down um, a little bit faster for us um so what you know usually in the form of of an acid um, or, okay. or something like sodium erythorbate, like you said. So the smoked meat stabilizer, I think, has an ascorbic acid in there yep. and maybe a citric acid I think so, yeah. a, a little bit. It does at least um, but yeah, uh, so just kind of depends on, on what you're looking at, but there's several different ways to kind of get there. So is that similar to, and I'm going to going to ask you to search your memory banks here. Uh, you had said to me once that it's not necessarily, if you if you mix in, uh, your cure up. So if you add your cure to the water and mix it up, it's not necessarily the water that's going to start making it gas out. It's impurities in water. Yeah. So, um, and Kurt and I have had the argument many, many times. Um, and, and we got, uh, uh, some professors involved in last time we had the argument and I, I won, um, <laughs> of course, um, I said, Hey, they're professors. They know what they're talking about. We, I won. Um, so it, yeah, it's not usually the water that really does it. Um, can't, can water kind of maybe accelerate, uh, maybe kind of, sort of, um, it's obviously helping the cure move. So you would have that aspect to it, but yeah, usually it's other things in water. I mean, water itself is fairly inert. And so it, it doesn't really want to react with much of anything. Usually right. it's not always the case. Um, but that's, that's why water is used for so many different things because it just doesn't react with, with different things. So in your, your customers, commercial plants, how important is it for them to use uh, deionized water or something like that? Is yeah. That so, key? so yeah, a lot, a lot of guys will have some sort of water filtration system in the plant. Um, as, especially depending on where you're at. Sometimes if you're coming off of, uh, some of the, some of the rural water that has a, uh, you know, they're not quite total rural, um, but, but they have just enough of a processing facility to get some stuff in there. You're in a big city. Oh, we just pump everything into there and you never know what, um, not that the stuff is bad for you, but in terms of reacting with, with the nitrite and things like that. Yeah. We run into that problem. A lot of hard water runs into problems. Um, and so they'll use something like a reverse osmosis system okay. for the whole plant that, that gives them pure water back out. Guys aren't going out and buying gallons and gallons and gallons of, you know, distilled water off right. Walmart yeah. shelf. Um, but usually they'll, they'll have some, some different systems in there to help with some of their water. Not all of them do, you know, I, I would say not even the, the vast majority of them do, but there are a lot of guys that, especially when, when they get on the sausage making side of things, if that is a heavy focus for them, they'll make sure they have something because it really affects the rest of the process down line.
Okay, so for sorry, just one more thing for a home user making a, a yeah. snack stick, uh, I was gonna ask a summer sauce. Okay, yeah. how important do you think it is that they use something like a deionized water? Yeah, it really, just kind of depends on on the person's local water source. I mean, y- you can take a look at what water does to the other things around your house. I mean, if, if you constantly have really bad buildup of water on you know sh- showers and and bowls and that kind of thing, like mm-hmm. if you open up the dishwasher and you just have white chalk all over everything like you got some really hard water and you probably should find a different source if you don't have that issue not really a huge deal because you're not really doing it at 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 the mass production levels um that it would really make a huge difference Uh, if you're really slow at processing it might make a difference you know if you're a guy that takes all day to make a 25 pound batch then you might think about doing something there um, but but as long as you're adding your seasoning, adding your water, getting it mixed right away, and and getting it stuffed, then you're not gonna have an issue. Because if it starts to gas out after you stuff it, or even during mixing, guess what? That's what we're shooting for. You know, we're trying to get that to happen. So to convert. Yeah. So there's there's not really a big issue there. So that's uh, that's the fear is that it, it's not that it's going to add a taste or anything. It's that it's going to react with the nitrite and actually gas yep, out. We'll, yep, okay. we'll, we'll lose that nitric oxide. Okay. So uh, and that 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 is a uh, you know if you don't want to do this, you don't want to make a bowl of it and mix it up and put it up under your face and see what happens because that that can be uh, very toxic for you. Um, so oh, yeah. avoid doing that. Um, don't, don't think, well, I'm going to test this and see if I can see or get vapors or anything like that. No, because it, it's, it's going to produce a toxic thing. You don't, you don't want to inhale that. Well, it is odorless, isn't it? Uh, I would believe so. I don't remember. I at one point wanted to mix, uh, water, nitrite, and uh, the smoked meat stabilizer, but you wouldn't let me. You don't do that. That's a bad diet. I know. It's a very bad, bad idea. idea. Right. I wanted to get a, like a video of it, and you wouldn't. They're, they're not, you're not going to like kill yourself by doing it in the room here. Oh. I mean, but it, don't, if you don't like tell him that. Don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. But if you're like standing over the top of it, it's it's not a great idea. Yeah, but a camera pointed at it would be safer, is what I'm getting from what you're saying. I'm concerned about work comp claims <laughs> at the low end, and John <laughs> being passed out and gone on the extreme end. <sighs> would it make a like a colored cloud, or do you think it'd just be? I don't know. I've never done it. (laughs) That would be something good that if we get Excalibur on here, I bet we can have one of the guys there uh, talk about that. Um, I think I remember getting the story from one of them about something going wrong. Yeah. At some point with that. So some say them, them mixing something and trying something and Uh seeing a bad reaction. Yeah. And and they they do a lot more because all they do is ingredients. You know they're they're going to have a lot more interaction with customers and their customers, and and they deal with some bigger people than we do. So yeah. they pr- they probably have um you know you, you go into a bigger plant and a lot of times something like sure cure is kept under or nitrites kept yep. under lock and key because it's a controlled substance. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, th- that's to keep people from don't know what they're doing taking it and dumping it into some water and causing a, a big problem yeah, the uh, the local bacon plant that i went on a tour of was awesome but the thing i think that amazed me the most was their nitrite was in a huge cage yep just yep. lock and key P- up. like two people had keys to it and it had something to do i, I guess they started locking up after 9 11 so, yeah I, yeah, I don't I don't know what the time know. frame there would that's be what, yeah. on regulation came through, but yeah. That's what he said at least. But yeah. All right. So anything else you can think that would be important to share about nitrites? I mean, you gave us a really thorough mm-hmm. just want to make sure what do they stop? Like what Why? Oh, what do they good. stop? Yeah, yeah. So we put nitrites in to stop Clostridium botulinum from growing, which is what you know, probably the most deadly pathogen that we have just because it takes such a small amount of that toxin uh, to kill somebody. And so the uh, Clostridium botulinum grows when it's in an anaerobic environment, so no oxygen. So um, when we put things into a vacuum package, um, we want to put sure cure in there. That's why, you know, things like snack sticks and summer sausage, um, Polish sausage, you know, those types of things are going to have it in it because typically they're going to be vacuum packaged. Uh, how would you define anaerobic? It's not doesn't have anything to do with working out. I imagine it's lack of oxygen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just I didn't think all of our, our that's what I said. I said I said no oxygen. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, I just heard anaerobic, and I was thinking about my joke by then. So. Trying to process the big word. 
<laughs> John sat there for 10 seconds pronouncing Anna. 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 Don't mess this up. Anna. Don't mess this up. And then I started thinking about jumping jacks and then it was over from there. It was probably just yeah. so up listening. Clostridium botulinum. Um, I, I think, and it's been a long time since I've spent much time on it, but I think it, you know, it has some other antibacterial properties that help with some other things, but the main thing is Clostridium botulinum. Yeah. That's the one you always see in the documentation. Now, uh, Clostridia, Clostridium, Clostridium botulinum. botulinum. Um, that creates a spore, correct? And once it's created, that spore is very hard to kill. Correct. So once you see people who are like, oh, you know, I did something, but it's fine. I'm going to cook it. Well, if you let it get to the point where it's creating that spore, I want to say it's something ridiculous like a thousand degrees. Yeah, not, nothing you would ever cook your food to for any of those things that are that are spore is, producers. It's going to take care of that spore. Yeah. So important, even though you think you're going to heat treat it later, if early in the process you have a major problem, you leave meat out for three hours when you didn't mean to, you thought you put it back in the fridge, done that once, um, throw it out. It's just not worth it. Uh, I, that will kill people. So. Do you know where Clostridium botulinum originates? Like, what is it from? The Latin root? <laughs> <laughs> or are you, are you asking, like, where is, it, where, is it, where is it commonly found? Like, how do you get it into your food source? Because, like, there's other things like e. soil, coli. water, GI tract. That's of you know. an animal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but soil and water. I mean, there's Clostridium botulinum and soil and water so okay. and and it's an intoxication would be going back to what you're saying about you know it's it's you actually get infected by by the sports it doesn't grow once it's inside you it's already done something um same with things like uh you know bacillus cereus is one um staphylococcus is, oh. a, is another one that's an intoxication um i think i think those are kind of the main pathogens that are intoxications but they're going to produce spores instead of actually ingesting the bacteria and the bacteria makes you sick. Gotcha. And it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I didn't spend enough time in school to, to remember exactly what the, uh, how, the amount is, but it's like, you know, nanograms or micrograms of the spore. Of the spore. Yeah. yeah. Um, so very, if I, very small, if I actually get some of the clostridium while it's before it's created a spore mm -hmm. in me, I'm okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not a right, professional, right, right, but right. I, yeah, you sh it, it you should certainly not should fairly bad. be okay, okay because yeah, it has to actually produce that toxin. And it's sure. the toxin that you ingest. Okay. So if it's found in soil and my son ate a handful of dirt two days ago, <laughs> he'll be all right. <laughs> okay. Just build up sure. immune system. <laughs> uh on a previous episode, I told a very rough story of uh the meat lab up at Kansas State that is negative pressure. And okay. has the acid pool? Is that accurate? I think I remember you telling me that. Oh, I I don't know if it's negative or pos positive pressure, um, but uh, their their bivap facility, right? Yeah, there's some there's some awesome things in there. So is that the bio research facility? Uh, maybe depends on what you're talking about. Whatever the one that they have been wor they were working on like 15 years ago, and yeah, they're still kind of. I, I still I haven't, I haven't actually looked in a while, um, but yeah, there's there's a yeah there's a facility up there that requires you got to walk through 18 different doors that take key cards and showers and changing clothes and that kind of thing. And I've I've been into part of that facility and it's it's pretty pretty cool facility. But they do, I don't know how much I could say about some of the things sure, inside of there. Understood. Oh, yeah, we're not asking what they're working on. Did you there. have to sign a waiver when you went in? Um, no, only because they were they were not running. Oh. There was, we they they took their own pictures and video. They brought their own cameras. Um, we didn't. We weren't allowed to take anything like that. But I didn't have to sign a waiver. But um, it might have been different because, like I said, yeah, we and they weren't running anything while I was in there. Gotcha. But it did have a floor that moved, and then a chain, a hoist that lowered carcasses that were infected into that acid. Right. I thought I remember you telling me that. Please, you look like no. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, yeah. That. Oh no, yeah. yeah it's, it's it was it was some sort of a uh, vat of basically acid right. is, is what I gathered from. I, I didn't actually go over and see it. I was just like, "What's that thing in the floor?" And they were describing it to me, and I was like, "Oh, that seems dangerous." <laughs> <laughs> 
going a little Breaking Bad here. We're we're gonna lower bodies into There's, like yep. fifty five gallon drums of acid and just. I was thinking James Bond. Never the, heard of James her. Bond villain. We definitely do that. So for our featured product today, this is a brand new product from HBC, which is Hamilton Beach, their commercial line. And this is a immersion sous vide circulator. It is the AccuVid 1000. It is brand new. We just got it in. It is NSF rated, so it can be used in restaurants, uh, smaller commercial kitchens that do a lot of mm -hmm. catering. Um, it's also ETL. And it will do 30 liters. And it will get 30 liters up to 203 degrees. I mean, that is... Pretty awesome. What is that in gallons? Uh, eight. Eight gallons? Eight gallons. Yeah. Somebody okay. check my math. Yeah. Okay, cool. Your math's right. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, so this is a great, going to be geared more towards either the very high-end home user or a commercial business. Um, For some of the guys that, yeah, we've had talking <laughs> like Park Cider. Talking about, hey, doing the, I'm going to finish my product in a sous vide bath. Right. This would be great because you can do like a meat lug of water at a sure. time. Yep. Um, if not more. I don't know how much our meat lugs hold, but I'm going to say that. You would least, top out right around there. Yeah. So you could fit a lot of product in there instead of trying to run like a large pot on your oven. Mm -hmm. But be, be great for guys wanting to do their own dry cured sausage at home. Um, and still get lethality on it. So it's a safety product um, using something like a sous vide and bringing it up to 128 and holding it for an hour or something. Is that after? Before. A af after uh, fermentation, before drying. Before drying. Right, right, right. Yeah. So it, it gives really accurate amounts. You can set it to 130 degrees and it will stay directly at 130 degrees. You don't have to worry about your smoker. For those who don't know, a lot of electric smokers uh, run on a wave pattern. So it's going to, if you set it for 130, it's going to kick on, get itself up to 140, let it drop down to 120. Once it reaches that, it'll kick it back on to 140. So it's going to go in a wave pattern the entire time. It's usually not that big a deal. But the advantage of something like this is you are dead on accurate the entire time. Yeah. I'm excited for the product, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> just because a lot of the other Hamilton Beach stuff we've had has, it's been selling really well and it's really nice. Like we've, we've still got three of their, uh, vacuum sealers yeah. sitting in the room over here. Uh, that's what I was going to say. I was really impressed with those. Yeah. I mean, I hear Hamilton Beach and I think blender and that's really <laughs> all I think, but yeah. no, they're a, an enormous company yeah. uh, and obviously they make really high quality products we're getting don't want to say too much but we'll have some other stuff from them very soon that i'm really excited to to test out mm -hmm. but as far as uh sous vides go this looks like it's about as top the line as a home user could possibly hope for I mean, yeah more bells and whistles than they probably would need but uh, if you want to buy something that's quality and going to last a long time comes with at least a one-year warranty um thought i saw something that might be longer but yeah i'm gonna, might, I'm gonna be safe and just say it's at least a one-year warranty uh well built so so to tangent again because i love tangents um we were talking earlier in the podcast about like frozen food and meals and who's who's doing a microwave or oven dinner versus making something i love these things for being able to do like a roast, like what Dylan was talking about, about how many people know what to do with a roast anymore. But it's as easy as a, a microwave dinner or an, uh, something you just throw in the oven that was already frozen. You just throw everything in a vac bag, you put it in a pot of water, you leave it till you come home from work and you dump it into a big container and you eat. Like it's, honestly, it's one of my favorite ways to cook for simple and convenience meals it can give you the ease of a, a crock pot yeah without cooking a good amount of the moisture out of the meat and but without having to clean things uh, that's good too. You, th you throw the vac bag the away vac when you're bag. done and you're done that's, that's my favorite yeah. part of it have either of you ever done uh like taken a, 
a frozen steak or cut a steak or anything right out of the freezer and thrown it in a, a sous vide. I've never run a sous vide. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's normally how I do it. Like, I don't let them sit out. Don't let them thaw. I get the sous vide up to temp, and I just throw the frozen steak in there, in the bag. I usually pre-season just so I don't have to mess with that because that's what I want to do is I just want to have something to throw in there and whenever I'm ready I pull it out and eat it so I do that with steak where I pre-season it put in a vacuum bag and then when I'm ready to eat just yeah start up throw it in frozen okay so you're pre-seasoning and then freezing you're not free okay okay Hmm. huh and that's working out well for you I've never done that before yeah it works okay Sometimes I'll still season afterwards, and that goes back <laughs> yeah, to well, what a huge surprise that is. <laughs> I know Austin over seasons everything. If, yeah, but if you didn't work for a company that sold seasonings, your seasoning budget would be out of control. It, do Do you agree that he over seasons things, or are you on that same? Yeah, no, him, him and Brett are the same way. Oh, Both okay. of them like something comes out and there's visibly salt on it, <laughs> and <laughs> both of them like grab the salt and put it on. You're like, dude, you didn't even try it first, like. <laughs> You don't, don't even you don't even know. I don't grab the salt. Salt is for pansies. Like <laughs> I grab like butter garlic or steak and roast. Well, I'm saying like at a restaurant if we're out. Oh, like, okay. Yeah, a restaurant. You'll grab the salt before you even tried a fry. You're like, well, that's gonna need some more. Yeah, because they're seasoning that for the below average to average user. And I know I'm a heavy user. Pe- so no. That's people without they're but... seasoning for people without high blood pressure. <laughs> I have high blood pressure and I still do that. So. <laughs> Real quick, do you guys, do either one of you ever order a steak out at a restaurant anymore? Uh, Yeah, there's, there's two places that I'll get steak at. Yeah. I you? will sometimes. Okay. It, it depends on the restaurant and it has to be like a special occasion because it is one of those things where I'm like, I can make this better at home. Yes, that's my thought on it. Or, or make it the same and not pay $28 for it. Yes, yes. true. Yeah. Plus, there are a lot of things like sauces and stuff I want to try on, like you know, a, a chicken pasta or something. And I'm never going to make that type of sauce. Yeah, yeah. But I'm absolutely going to cook a steak. So yeah, I'm not going to go through all the work of you know something just like a yeah a chicken chicken pot pie for crying right. out loud. Yeah, that's, that's way too much work. work. Like just take a steak out and cook it. That's easy. <laughs> very easy. So yeah, it just I, I always see when we're out to dinner all these people buying steaks, and I'm like, you could do that just as well at home. Makes me sad. Makes me sad. All right. So this will be, or this is now live on uh, waltonsinc.com. And by the time this comes out, it'll be extra live. Do you want to give an extra sneak peek? Are we going to make people wait for it? Um, What are we doing with these? Oh, yeah. We can talk about it. It'll be at the same time. So uh, for anyone who has checked out our monthly sales video, we are going to be giving away a few of these uh, for this month's giveaway. So there will be at least two winners. Uh, go to waltonsinc.com slash win. We'll have ways to enter there. You can watch our sales video at waltonsinc.com slash sales or on our YouTube page. Um, yeah, we are going to give away at least two of these this month with a good chance of something extra happening at next yeah. month's live stream um so yeah yeah by the time this comes out that video should have already dropped okay so if you weren't following us there or if you hadn't seen that yet go ahead and check it out so to move on from there our well one of our last things for the day is customer questions so if you want to be a part of our customers customer questions segment Email us at podcast at waltonsinc.com and we will answer your questions, Dylan, quote unquote, live. <laughs> Not live, live, but Not quote live, unquote, live. live. But we've got a couple different questions today to answer. Our first one is from Ryan Jones, or better known as Tex, Tex. on the Meet Justics forums and community site. Tex is asking, Oh, hello. And I just lost it. There we go. Okay. Tex is asking, what is the difference between a Frank and a wiener? Like, are all hot dogs created equal? Are they all the same? 
what is the difference between a Frank, a wiener, oh, this, a hot dog? Anything you want to call it? This, this is this is my question. That's for you. I looked yeah. up and both of you just looking right at me. And I'm like, oh, I thought this was like a round table here. It can be a round table, but, but it won't be. We want your opinion on it. Um, well, you know, the seasoning we sell is a Frank and wiener. So um, one, one would think that the first thought is there's not a difference there. Um, actually went and asked a, a customer and said, Hey, what, what's the difference in a Frank and a wiener for a guy that's been around a long time and does a lot of different product. And he, he said he always thought it was just diameter. So, uh, a wiener would be something that's, that's a little smaller, maybe 26 and under, um, Frank is something more like a bratwurst size. And then, uh, he even threw in, you know, a knockwurst would be, he would consider in the same category, um, but just with more garlic, um, than the other two had in them. Um, and then maybe like a, a dinner sausage size. So like kielbasa, 40 millimeters, okay. something around that, that size. Um, so bes- when, besides that, I think you're, um, probably making up stuff on what you think might be different. There's, there's nothing in, in the, um, nine CFR about what makes one different than the other or in the label policy book. Can you quickly just tell them what a nine CFR is? So that's just the federal registration code where it pretty much lists out definitions and requirements for, um, most things meet. Okay. Yeah. What makes this sausage a sausage? Like yep. Italian sausage has to have fennel. Yeah. So what what's the requirement for labeling? So be, between yeah, between that that and the and then going to the label policy labeling policy book, which says things like, you know, if if you're gonna call it a Virginia ham, it has to come from Virginia. Things like that. Looking in both of those, nothing about Frank and Wieners that differentiates them just describes what they are as a whole and so they they have the same same thing between both of them same requirements for both of them but no, nothing that would differentiate them i wonder if some of it is like a area of the yeah, country regional yeah. yeah regional yeah just just what people are used to calling it really that's developed over the years yeah. i mean um where, where would frankfurt be i mean uh frankfurter I mean, one would assume that it came from there originally and a, a wiener, you know, that'd be more of a German um, type of thing. So just different different locations and where they came from originally probably, but they're probably really similar product. And and they've just kind of molded to be, you know, Frank, wiener, hot dog, what you know, whatever we're going to call it. So I have another tangent. Do you want to call something a pop or a soda? Soda pop. No, you can't do both. It's soda pop. It's a uh, soda. It's pop. Uh, soda pop. We've had this conversation so many times. It's clearly soda. Even the way he's saying it, mine comes first. You're so. you're from the north though, so you say soda. <laughs> I, I don't say soda. That's like the Minnesota. Minnesota. They would say soda. Yeah, but uh, uh, everything soda. from the north, I think, is Minnesota or not Minnesota soda. Uh, everything more from the south is like pop. No, that's not accurate. I um, think so. Yeah, growing up in Albany, uh, our oh. family out in uh, oh yeah uh, Rochester, York, oh. where I eventually lived, used to say pop. We yeah. Used to argue over. I that. think pretty sure pops northern too. Coke would be from the south. Yeah. Give okay. me, I, I'll take a Coke, and then they look at you like you're an idiot. Like, what do you want? And you're like, I want a <laughs> Coke. Coke or Pepsi. <laughs> But I'm yeah, pretty was, sure that's from the uh, South, right? Like a diet soda? Is a diet Pepsi okay? I, I don't know. Is a sharp kick to the shins okay? Like, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's be mad. Wow, we got John worked up there. Yeah, I, I, I like soda. Okay, so the next customer question. We've got one from Cody Weiss. I want to say it's Weiss. Yeah, that's how I read it. Okay. Uh, he says, first of all, thank you so much for starting the podcast. I've been looking for a meat making podcast. I really enjoy it. So we also do appreciate when you guys send us comments. So even if you just have a comment, um, email us at podcast at and let you know, uh, let us know what you think of the show. But his question is, I am looking at building a large smoker for sausage as I have four master built smokers and it's not enough. Yeah. So could you guys talk about adding steam to a smoker, cold showering, maybe fans? It would be great to hear how a commercial smoker works and the differences between a commercial and a home use smoker. There's not a lot of information online about commercial smokers. So my first thought is we we could get into the very nitty gritty of like the cheapest home smokers. But I think from what we sell and what we do, I think we have a good example of 
a still higher end home smoker in the PK100 from Pro Smoker. And then we also have a 500T, a 500 pound monstrous smokehouse in our test kitchen. So I think this one is mostly geared towards Dylan. I think John and I both have some input there, but Dylan's going to have the best input on. Yeah, what's what's this guy's name and number? I'll have one of my salesmen reach out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's obviously different levels of a commercial smokehouse, but yeah. just comparing the PK100 to a 500T, what does that 500T have that makes it so special, Dylan? Yeah, so the main the main difference when we start looking at commercial smokehouses really come down to airflow and humidity are, are pretty much the two things that that win the day with those units. Um, so the the amount of airflow coming in a, in a commercial oven um, is a huge amount of airflow. Um, I don't know if your PK one hundred does even have airflow in it. No, no. fan. Okay. Um, so the only airflow that you have is just from gravity, just from heat wanting to rise, pulling in. I think there's a side vent on it. Front, there's front, a front, yeah, front, front bottom vent. and a, a top okay. top. Okay. So, so just the natural draft that you might get, which is not much. Um, so when you're looking at a commercial smokehouse I mean, we're looking about moving air, um, and they talk about, um, different things like air changes, you know, how many times, um, uh, maybe does the air inside leave, and you get brand new air every minute, you know, things, things like that. Um, but the key point there is, is um, I think one of you has said it, uh, break points, you know, where's, where's the break point at and how does the break point move? Um, Cause you're, you're going to have a, a hot and a cold spot potentially um, unless you design the oven like pro smoker has to, you know, have, have a great break point so that you don't end up with hot and cold spots inside that oven. So um, that's that's kind of the, the main thing there. You, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in the bottom right of the smoker or you're in the top left. Um, they, they read the same. It doesn't matter on a pro smoker, but for uh, somebody at home, how they load their smoker will matter, correct? Oh yeah, ab- yeah. absolutely. Yeah, if you're if and and it doesn't mean that we just take a big box and we put a big fan on top of a big box. That's that's not. If it was that, then why doesn't, it, fix why doesn't everybody do sure. it? So, there's some engineering that there, goes yeah, there's, into there's engineering that, that comes into it and how that how it's shaped and how how strong the air blows makes a big difference. Because I mean, you, if you blow too much air, you actually ruin your break point, um, and the air just kind of scatters when it hits itself. So in a big oven, you know, it's going to come it's going to come down our sides um, from the fan, uh, go down, hit the bottom, run across the bottom, hit the middle, and then go back up, and so. If, if you have too little air, it doesn't reach all the way down there. If you have too much air, it hits and crashes too hard. Um, so there's there's more to it than just put a fan in a stainless steel box. Right. Now you say hit the middle and it would go back up, but that's because it's running into a current that's going on the opposite Correct, side. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so because hitting. the two sides are, are going to meet and, and they're going to go back up the middle and it's going to pull air up the middle because um, the fan is, is there. So it's pulling air up and then sending it back down. How important is it uh, that it you said switches out the air every uh, few minutes? Like just being uh, not even a layman at commercial yeah. smokehouses, I feel like that would be inefficient for heat. Is that not accurate? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not. You you obviously want the, want the air to keep moving, so you want to know how how quickly the air is moving. But yeah, how much of it leaves, and do you want to use the same air over and over again? Um, I, I don't know if there's a lot to stand on there. If you want to try and make your case one way or the other, okay. um, personally, um, I, I know about a lot of different lines of smokehouses and all the, you know, different things that those guys want to sell and push. And even our own manufacturer, what, you know, the, the things that they'll tell you and they'll say, um, and, and not that they would tell you that something that's wrong. Um, but I don't, I don't know whether it's, it's really that important of a deal when I'm kind of looking at, you know, ovens commercially and, and cause there's plenty of my customers that don't use ovens from us and doesn't mean that they have a terrible product no um and so there's there's still a lot there, there's valid things and there's not some of it are just you know buzzwords kind of a deal um yeah so uh the and then the other thing humidity can we control humidity and accurately control humidity uh because that's going to allow us to cook really fast change the the smoke how the smoke's going to set on the product we can change how much smoke color we get just by changing humidity around um you know, or we want a wrinkled snack stick, a straight snack stick that has a nice smooth surface, all those types of things we can pretty much just control with humidity. So um, they, they will be better in terms of heat. You know, you talked earlier about you could have a heat band that's maybe 30 or 40 degrees. 
Um, so the heat band being that, you know, if you're set at 150, are you going to go up to 180 and then right. down to 120? So a lot more accurate heat band. Um, the other with thing with the humidity, with the humidity, okay. um, the humidity will fluctuate a little bit and you want it to fluctuate, especially when drying product. Um, the other thing that a lot of people don't think about is, is when we dry product, we, we actually want to have humidity in there. Um, because otherwise you just dry the outside of the product. You don't get time for that water to migrate to the outside of the surface of the product. So especially bigger product, if you don't have humidity, all you'll do is case harden the outside of that product. And now your water can't come out. So you have a really tough, crusty outside and it still has a really high moisture content on the inside, which is not a good product. We want it to be even throughout. So that's why it takes like 16 hours to cook a ham on a PK 100. (laughs) And then (laughs) a lot less to cook it in a commercial smokehouse. Yeah, n- not so much for the drying, but it is because of humidity because the, you know, water can transfer heat a lot better than air can. You know, the easiest example for anybody is let's get a pot of boiling water on the stove. You know, that's 212 degrees or whatever it would be here at our elevation, you know, 212 degrees. And then let's set the oven to 212 degrees. I'll stick my hand in the oven. You stick yours in the pot of boiling water and let's see who can last longer. Yeah. I'm in for this, Fair Dylan, point. John. Uh, I'm I taking, see a challenge. I'm taking the oven, not... <laughs> So, no, it wasn't an option. You're, so that, you're on the you know, boiling water. That, that's the easiest way to explain what humidity does and how it can cook faster in, in, a, in a tangible way for people to understand it um, is, is how it transfers the heat. You explained it to me once as um, we were talking about evaporation energy and you were saying that if you're sweating and you're in an uh, environment with no humidity, that moisture is going to evaporate off your skin and cool you down very easily. If you're in a high humidity, like you want a smoker to be during the cooking phase, it's already saturated. The air is already saturated, so it can't pull that moisture off your skin and cool it down as quickly. Yeah, same, same reason that we sweat is, is to cool ourselves right. down. And so the meat will sweat inside that smokehouse unless you have enough humidity in there, and then it doesn't allow it to sweat. It just means the heat's going to penetrate down through. It keeps so, going yeah, in. Yeah. yeah, that'd be the yep. same general concept there. Nope. So uh, besides that, you know, they have things like a microprocessor on a smoker. A computer um, for which, the layman. Which is, <laughs> which is going to control, uh, yeah, the, the programs. We can put all different kinds of, of steps in there. So you can have step one, two, three, four, five. They each have their own settings for kind of every aspect of the oven. Whereas, you know, if you're doing it at home, you, you run over and you bump the temperature up and then you set a timer on your phone and let it run for an hour and then you go, change the temperature again and then right. change it and then change the temperature again. And take we, a nap in there and take a nap in there yeah. somewhere. It goes over too yeah. long. Yeah, now your nap can be longer and you can drink more beer because you, you run the micro and it, it does everything for you. And then you also get the same product out every time. That I think is one of the key things is that when you run a commercial smokehouse, you get the same product every time. Consistency. Because yeah, yep. as much as I love like our PK100 or even some of the other smokehouses we've had, the product does vary every time. Every little sure. condition changes it, but you control all those little scenarios in that commercial smokehouse. Yeah, just the temperature or the humidity of the air outside will yep. play a factor with the PK. It doesn't with the commercial smokehouse. Yeah. So we can have things like, you know, a, a smoke generator uh, that makes it really easy to turn off and turn on smoke. Um, showers, so you don't have to take it out and yeah. dump it in a lug. Um, that has ice water in it it's going to automatically shower it so um different things some of the smoke houses um that we do um have actually uh, essentially air conditioning you know they have refrigeration built into them um so somebody can roll a smoke truck in at the end of the day and you know it only takes two hours two and a half hours to do my snack sticks um but i want to have it done in the morning well i can't just leave it in there all night so roll it in start the refrigeration and it'll actually hold those at 40 degrees until you want it to start cooking, refrigeration will turn off, then the smoker will run and be ready. That way, when you come oh, in wow. first thing in the morning, pull out the sticks and, and you're ready to go. Wow. So you get- Ours, doesn't ba- ha- why ours does not have that. Okay. Why, I was why say, wow. don't we have that yeah. on ours? I want all it takes that. is money. You oh, and I need to go talk to Brett, have a little owner's meeting and figure out why we don't have refrigeration on ours because I need that now. No, I don't think so. I'm good. I'm good. I'll pass. Oh, okay. I feel like well, we want it. Well, I just I just lost because <laughs> <laughs> there goes two thirds. <laughs> yeah, I don't get a vote. There huh? went two thirds. Oh, well. So, <laughs> oh well. Dylan, 
honestly, you have been a great guest. This was really useful. Um, is there anything else you want to say? Anything you want to touch on? I don't think so. Okay. Um, pretty pretty easy. That was excellent. Do you want to talk about your hol- or helicopter kills last night? Like anything <laughs> <like>? <laughs> People won't believe they were it. Impressive. You have to, you have to <laughs> they see were it to impressive. believe it. Oh, you showed it to John. Yes, oh. I saw it. Yes. Yeah, I don't feel like he appreciated it though. I, I don't did. think he quite understands. I just, you know, he's like, oh yeah, that's, it's that's great. That's awesome, but he he doesn't truly understand. <laughs> I guess not. I'm gonna guess a lot of our viewers want to truly understand. <laughs> so we're talking about video games and Call of Duty, little war zone action. Dylan did shot some, somebody some off the side of a helicopter night. twice, which I mean, it was very impressive. In like two minutes, it was amazing. <laughs> He's very proud of He's himself. not only a food scientist, but he's a hardcore gamer. <laughs> Maybe not hardcore, but he's a yeah, good gamer. Yeah, probably not hardcore. I'll take it. I'll but, take it. Yeah. <laughs> very Definitely a very good one. But I think we've reached the end. I don't think we have anything left that we could possibly... Well, I'm sure there's plenty more sure? we could try to pull out of I think we have more them. beer in the fridge, so we could probably keep talking for well, a while. We can, we can hang around after that. Yeah, we'll, we'll save it all for next time. But we'll let the, the viewers and the listeners go. Guys... Thanks for being here. Again, if you have anything you want us to cover, a comment, a question, anything, get us at podcast at waltonsinc.com. Uh, Austin and I monitor that every day. I have not been responding to people saying we've got your question. <laughs> have you at all? <laughs> no. No. I responded we to We are a getting couple. your questions. You I have. Okay. I responded to a couple just because I had like some follow-ups and some uh, personal soft stories or okay yeah oh is that where uh like uh, i don't remember i did something with text okay on something oh yeah the this is very okay. specific yeah this is great <laughs> yeah the very very in, informative we're, yeah so so the long story short we're gonna do a better job being personal there right we we'll, will we'll respond try to, get to your back question to, to let you and, know yeah. whether or not we're gonna respond to it what episode we will respond to it um but for right now we're gonna get out of here we're gonna let you guys go Thanks a lot for being with us. Dylan, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. See you.